When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you could save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. Blog Talk Radio. Here we go. Let them know. Season 7, another lesson. Seek truth, social media group. It's our showtime, I'm on the Israel. It's new, we hit a debate for you. It's clear that we're breaking through. I congratulate the crew, it's just uh-huh. a few. Shows and platforms with honor and virtue. Round table special guests calling to alert you. All the information people say is relevant. Different views, mono, we mono and settle it. If you don't know, we got what you need. And so I'll show time to bait talk for you with the brand new season. Season. I was surfing the net, one day I found the show Hit the download button and I was ready to go Topics ranging from all kind of things I should know It was bringing the glow, Block Talk Radio It's a whole new breed, road to succeed Study ways to give the globe what they need The code, unfolding the scrolls to be freed From the woes that was told by those who stampede Seek truth, fill a year, the style red Elohim turns swords into plowshares Bury hatchet, word flurry, swirl match it Spit it out, then wait, the world catch it Prophecy, you must rise, truth must lies, two plus five, fear God you wise, rhythm let them have it, give them lyrics automatic, threads and fabric, speaking dudes in their habit, thinking my tutorial, the scriptures, my fingers are slipping, the pages and getting, information that's written, hitting the studio, charged up, blazing and spitting, it's amazing they glisten and people pay me to listen so I continue to rock like Will Smith, rise to the top, Jazzy Jeff, the success just don't stop, first Grammy ever given in hip hop, the big talk for you family, get props. Yo style show be true Yo style show be true Yo style show be true Listening to the Big Talkie Radio. Yo, what up? It's your boy K for H, representing East New York, Brooklyn. I'm in the building with my man Sal Showtime. He holding it down with the Debate Talk for You Radio. Tune in every Monday through Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Also, check out that late night and early morning mixtape. And that black hoodie ish mixtape. It's your boy K for H, and you're now listening to Debate Talk for You Radio. Certified, stamped it, approved it. Hey, what's up? This is Uncle E from the Uncle E Show on YouTube. You're now listening to Debate Talk for You Radio. Please check in every Monday through Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Call up if you got questions. The number is 319. What else? Five two seven. What else? Six two. What else? Three nine. Got it. Please press one for question and comments. 
And also check out my show on YouTube at Renegades TV. Big shout out to my brother, Sal Showtime. Let's get it. I come to you today in peace. My name is Imuna Yisrael, recent author of The Angry Quote-Unquote Black Woman Syndrome Revisited, Volume 1, Her Mind. It is a hot new piece all about the mind of the quote-unquote angry black woman. How does she operate in this society? How has slavery affected her? Just opening up really a 200-plus-year-old stereotype. So if you haven't taken a look as yet, Go ahead over to www.imunayisrael.com and you can definitely check that out. Or you can just go to Amazon and look up Angry Black Woman Syndrome Revisited and see us there. You can check me on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, you know, Periscope, YouTube, everything under Imuna Yisrael. So until next time, thank you for tuning in and definitely be the change that you desire to see in the world. One. Hi, this is Tyrone Thompson, host of the Blog Talk Radio broadcast, Talk Real Solutions. Please tune in and listen to all of our shows seven nights a week at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At Talk Real Solutions, we cover a variety of topics to ensure we speak about what may be needed in our community at any time. Talk Real Solutions is the hottest Blog Talk Radio show going on right now. You can listen to our broadcast at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash talk real solutions or visit our website at www.talkrealsolutions.com. Also like our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash talk real solutions. You can call in at any time during the show and add to the conversation and offer your solutions at 1-858-357-8453. That's 1-858-357-8453. Because at Talk Real Solutions, we want to make sure you have a chance to talk real solutions. You don't want to miss checking out the most controversial video of the year. Everybody's talking about it. A video produced by Absolute Bible Truth teacher, Brother Josh. The video is entitled, Is There a Secret Gay Agenda Amongst the Comedic Conscious Groups? Once again, it's one of the most talked about videos right now. And you want to make sure you go check it out. So go to the website, www.absolutebibletruth.com forward slash store. And once you get it, it's an automatic download. You don't have to wait for it to be sent to you in the mail. It's an automatic download. So once again, go check out the video, get it fast, and get it now. Peace and blessings, family. This is your good, humble brother, Bassem, representing the DMV area. And when I'm not holding down my mid-level position in corporate America, I'm tuned into the most respected debate show on the globe. That's Debate Talk for You with the esteemed host, Sal Showtime. This is Renald Francois representing from Atlanta, Georgia. And when I'm not busy in the studio, I'm checking out Debate Talk for You radio. Keep up the great work, Sal Showtime. Hey, what's going on, family? How you guys doing? Welcome to another show. You're now listening to Season 7 of Debate Talk for You I'm your host, Sal Showtime, and we are back with another relationship challenge. That's why each, you know, we have the show uh, every other Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And I see we have a lot of people that's listening via phone and via Skype. We appreciate you guys for tuning in. And, again, it's going to be another classic show for you guys. Get your pen and pads ready to take down some notes. But most of all, feel free to call in. The new number is 319-527-6239. 
Make sure you save that in your cell phones, put it on speed dial. <laughs> so you can check out Debate Talk for you at any given time. For those that are new, uh, Debate Talk for you is usually on from Monday to Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. But, you know, of course, check the schedule to see if we're going to be on on certain days because some days we're not on uh, during the week. But usually from Monday to Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, go to www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Debate Talk for you and check out the show's schedule. Today's show is entitled, I'd Hit It. Discussing domestic violence in a community. <laughs> yeah, man. once again, discussing domestic violence in a community. Um, I got a lot of uh, response, a lot of emails in regards to this particular topic. Um, and I actually uh, spoke to a few people uh, today earlier, and they said they're going to try to call in. People that actually went through some domestic violence uh, situations. So we'll hopefully, we hope to hear from those people that actually went through some of the domestic violence and a lot of our people in that community actually uh, been through it also or witnessed our parents go through that or somebody that we know went through some domestic violence. So we're going to tackle this topic tonight. We're here on Debate Talk Radio. And again, feel free to call in. Uh, when you call in, you got to press number one and we'll add you to the conversation. For those that are new listening to the show, uh, don't be shy. Let your voice be heard. And the show is archived, people. You can go back and check it out uh, later on. You can check it out in the iTunes podcast. We have iTunes. Go check out our podcast section. Let's type in Debate Talk for You. Of course, it's going to be up on YouTube later on. And all things social media, just type in Debate Talk for You Radio. But let's go to the host of this show, The Relationship Challenge, the creator of The Relationship Challenge. She is here. You can check out her YouTube channel as well by typing in on YouTube, Ramona Israel. Uh, she's one of the hardest working people on social media. <laughs> I see her almost every day doing videos, informing the people, educating the people, letting them know about different things when it comes to the Bible. And uh, she's here tonight once again. Uh, press the, oh, yeah, there you go. You press number one. Uh, Mona Israel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Sal. What, a, what an introduction today. That was nice. Thank you, Brother Sal. Oh, praise be to the most high. Um, definitely Mona Israel here. I want to say uh, greetings and welcome to all who are tuning into the Relationship Challenge. Like you, Brother Sal, got, uh, got, you know, got some few uh, comebacks as it relates to this challenge, um, this conversation and many people are kind of surprised because this kind of stuff is not usually spoken about. Um, and so at this time, because it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the whole month of October, we're going to definitely dive into this topic and explore and give people a voice and a space where they can express themselves. So definitely buckle your seatbelt because uh, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> and so, yeah, we're going to go to the home panel and then we'll introduce the topic. So Brother Sal, the mic is Oh, by the way, if you enjoyed the debate talk for you, as Brother Sal said, Monday through Friday, um, he has a support button where it is that you can support the show to continue to keep the debate talk for you on the air. So, Brother Sal, the mic is yours. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. All right, so, yeah, let's go to the home panel. You know, the home panel is the, you know, special guests, uh, not special guests, but they're always here all the time, every single show. They've been here from the beginning, and they're still here. We're going to actually try to add more people later on in the near future to the home panel, but, you know, we appreciate our home panel that's right here. We're going to go to, uh, first of all, the Water Swords, man. What's going on, the war? How you feeling? Hey, shalom, shalom, brother. Shalom, sister. How you doing, man? How's everything? Uh, we're doing pretty good. Everything doing pretty good. good. Anything want to? Anything want to say to the people before we begin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, come out tomorrow. I'm doing my show, uh, Night of Fire again. It's going to be the title. Going to be uh, what well, I think it's uh, a murderer. Uh, he that kill. He that hit up his brother is a murderer. That's the title. He that hit up his brother is a murderer. And we're going to go deep into the hatred of our people towards each other. We're going to go real deep in the spirit. It's going to be a good show. Come out and support. Show love, show love and put your support in it. And if you love your people like you say you do, come and support and bring your input. I'm going to leave it like that. All right. That's a water swordsman right there. Let's go to my sister. You know, actually, you know, she's one of the best people out there to get some flyers done. Like, you know, right now, <laughs> so you got to eat some flyers. You're done. You got to reach out to my sister, Mayana, right here. And she also has a new YouTube channel. I actually put it up in the description box, and I'm going to put it up in the YouTube description box as well. Uh, it's brand new, a brand new YouTube channel. Go subscribe. This is Mayana. John, so welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Shalom. Shalom to everyone here on the on, on the panel and in the whole seat and, of course, the li- uh, listening audience family. As you just heard, I'm Mayana Hasa Ferret, and I really been looking forward 
to having this conversation in this space and at this time with all of you. As of October 21st, my YouTube channel, I shall very considerately pledged for me, has gone live. For those of you who have watched, liked, and subscribed already, thank you so much for your support and feedback. If you haven't checked it out yet, please search under Elder Mayana Hassel Ferret to watch and give me your thoughts. They don't let me um, customize that for you guys yet. They, they give me the generic until we have 100 confirmed subscribers. We can look forward to the release of more initiatives as the D2M Inc. brand grows out of its 20-year grassroots and joins the stage of media outreach. The website is scheduled to go live in the beginning of the secular year, and my first publication is expected to drop at the start of the Hebrew calendar this coming spring. So everybody look forward to that, and um, I'm looking forward to your feedback and your suggestions. So with that, I yield the floor. All right, that's Sister Mayana right here on the Bay Talk Radio. Like I said, I'm going to leave the link in the description box on Blog Talk and on the YouTube page. So, and that's for everybody that's uh, on the panel. You can check them out, check their videos, check out their work, uh, to, uh, support their pages, social media, uh, things of that nature. But let's go to our special guest uh, that's going to be on the panel joining us for this discussion, domestic violence. We have my brother. He, he, he was here a couple times before for the first season of the Relationship Challenge. So he's back today, and I appreciate the brother. I'm going to have my brother Amasa, y'all. Welcome to the show. Huh? Are you there? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Oh, I mean, baby's in the background. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well I, I'll text her. Uh, hey, I got to wait, get ready and see if you can call back in. It's all right. We got some babies in the background. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, check, yeah. I'll check on that. I'll check on that. Yeah, check, yeah, check on that. Check on that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get this thing started, though. And I see somebody else pressing number one, though. Uh, uh, Mona, you want me to get that, or you want me to see who that is, or you want to wait no, till we get started? No, go ahead, brother. It's started. supposed to be a 678 number. We have a, um, we also have a sister mm-hmm. who's going to be on the panel, 678 number. So if you see that number oh, okay. pressing one, go ahead and, and free it up. All right, so let's go to that 678. You're live on the air. Six seven eight, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I'm I'm here. Hey, how you doing? Uh, introduce yourself to the people. Introduce yourself. How are you? Okay. Good evening. My name is Adayahu. And um Yeah, shalom everyone. <laughs> Hi, right, shalom, shalom. Welcome to the show. We appreciate you. Uh, I see another person pressing the one. Let me check to see, see what it says. Let's go to seven oh two. 806, who am I speaking to? 702 806, can you hear me? Hello? All right, I guess this is listening. All right, let's get this day show started. And like I always say, get your pen and pads ready, take down your notes. And of course, uh, we're going to have the listening audience join in later on. And, uh, you know, it's going to be another one of those uh, serious shows. So make sure you uh, call in and uh, share your personal you know, stories about if you actually went through these things or you know anybody that went through domestic violence. The phone line is open. Again, the number is 319-527-6239. Let's go to the host of the show. Amuna, take it away. All right, all right, all right, all right now. Uh, definitely, as Brother Sal said, the tone of the show is going to be one that, you know, we have to show some respect for those who have been injured in this space, uh, children who come up in this space, people who have lost their life in this space. Um, so definitely we continue to keep it clean and professional. The name of the show is I Hit It, um, speaking about domestic violence. And when myself and Sister Mayana was brainstorming, we started to think about how it is that we even, in spaces that we're supposed to have a level of respect for one another, masculine to feminine energy, it's kind of so rough, even in the lingo. So a man would say, I hit it, saying that he laid with the woman, you know. And if anybody else is listening, oh, like, hit it, well, you know, what are you saying? Oh, I smashed it, you know. And, and this type of language, even even the energy that comes off when it's being expressed, is very uh, violent in, in, in its energetic expression. Uh, and so we said it, you know, kind of like a play on words, because the reality is that men, many times when you say domestic violence, 
And then you say a conscious community or a Hebraic community or people who should know better. Because these things are polar opposites in the minds of the people, many people suffer in silence. Because, you, you know, it's hard to say you're over there singing the 133rd Psalm and then after you come off, then you're beating up on your wife or you're beating up on your children. And so this, this dichotomy that exists within our community is that you're supposed to know better. You know what I'm saying? I can't believe what you're saying. And so oftentimes uh, people who are going through this, and I want to say both men and women and children experience domestic violence. So before I go to the panelists, I wanted to just say that domestic violence manifests itself in different ways. There's uh, mental abuse, uh, like that also within emotional abuse, as well as physical abuse and sexual exploitation. All of these things fall into the domestic abuse, you know. So somebody can say that, you know, the person never hit them, but they call them names all the time. They're stupid, they're incompetent, they're illiterate. You know, you're a Jezebel, you're this, you're that. That is also a form of abuse because what one is looking to do is manipulate the other party with your words. You're trying to crush the spirit, and and then the Torah speaks about uh the value or the power of the tongue. And so for us not to say that we don't know that what the words that we're saying have a, an effect on others, then that means to a certain degree we're really not in line with what's going on. And so I wanted to bring that out because sometimes people think that because you're not putting your physical hands on someone that you are not in some way affecting that soul, you know, and looking to break that spirit. So, again, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, but there's, there's a level of abuse or exploitation that takes place in the spiritual realm as well. But for right now, you know, we'll probably talk about emotional and physical, which is the one that is to the forefront of many people's minds because it often leaves signs. You know, whether it is a black eye, whether it's a broken arm, whether it's a bruise here where the person say, I'm just slapping them around or whatever the case may be. Uh, these things, once you realize that you're in this type of abusive space, and especially in a conscious space where it is assumed that you should know better, you, we as a people need to begin to look at these signs or be more in tune with what domestic violence looks like so that it doesn't get escalated to the point of somebody loses their life, to the point where somebody is hospitalized. Um, and, again, I say in there before I pass the mic for the opening statements, it happens with both men and women. It's not only the man. Oftentimes we think because the man is more, the more dominant uh, person, the one who's more forward, who has more physical strength, then he is the only one who could be abusing or mistreating people within the household. But that is not true. We can have... Under domestic violence is also sibling abuse, siblings abuse and sibling violence because domestic means all things that are in or pertain to the domicile. So it can be husband to wife. It can be wife to husband. It can also be children abusing children. And all of these things, hopefully, um, we can bring into the middle of the proverbial floor and flesh out. Because, again, the picture that our popular media has painted for us is the one woman cowering in the corner, and she's being a domestically abused. But hopefully, you know, I was able to broaden the scope as we go into this conversation and, you know, discuss it. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and go to Sister Mayana for her opening statements and then come to uh, – or actually, I'll go to um, – Sister Adiyua, if I said your name wrong, please forgive me, and please tell me again. Um, Adiyahu, I think yeah, that's what she said, Adiyahu. I'll go to you first because um, you're our guest, and then you know, I'll go around the board and we'll go from there. So let us know your thoughts on domestic violence. Is there any exposure? Have you seen anyone going through this um, within the knowledge of self, and how has it affected your reality? So Sister Adiyahu, the mic is yours. Okay. Um, um Okay, so you're talking to a person that's coming in from a leaf. From a leaf, uh, two generations of um, domestic abuse. Uh, when it came down to my mother, um, when I got a little bit older, like in my teen years and stuff like that, my mom would, uh, would get into it and, and um, whoop me, she'll hit me, we'll go back and forth, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then I wanted to protect myself from her and and not be exposed to those type of, to being hit as much as I was getting hit, you know, um, 
started older man and um, started to be exploited sexually. And then when I got older and I had my son, I um, I told myself that I wouldn't hurt my son like my mother hurt me, and I wouldn't allow him to be um, molested or, or touched or or see anything on TV that would hurt him. So I started to really protect him. I um, I took away the TV, you know, um, like he really protective from the things that he saw in the home to when we go out. Um, but then, although I was trying to protect him, um, I still had these underlying issues within myself that I had had never dealt with, you know. And so when he would do, like, maybe the little smallest things, um, and this was when he was maybe around one or, or two, I've never actually really spoken about this before, but um, I whooped him. I used to beat him, and um, I remember one time he had did something, and I raised my hand up to him, and I saw him, like, like collar. Like, he was so afraid, so afraid of me. And um, I I think that's when I had, like, this big old uh, chase me, like, this big old aha moment. Like, this is not what I want. I don't want my son to be afraid of me. I don't want him to be flinching every time I raise my voice or uh, if I'm trying to correct him. I don't want him to feel scared that I'm going to um, hurt him, you know. And so um, that caused me to really – I start searching within myself, trying to fix whatever it was that was in me that needed to be fixed, you know? So I started getting more, more and more into the word. And um, because, you know, I didn't want this to be passed down to him. I didn't want him to have to deal with the things that I'm dealing with now. And it still is a process for me, you know, because he's so young and I'm still, um, and I'm still dealing with him. You know, and I'm so raising him, and I want him to be this great man of yeah. You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want him to grow up having um, mommy issues, right? Like uh, so many um, quote unquote black men have today. You know, I don't want him to be like that. So I totally understand this. I totally recognize it, and um, yeah, but that's yeah, that's it. Wow! Thank you for that was that, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you for sharing your struggles. For those who just joined us, we're talking about domestic violence in the community, and and you know, I, I thank Sister Adi the Yahoo for sharing that experience because again, it takes on domestic abuse takes on different faces, and so what she shared was the excessive uh, abuse or the excessive punishment of a child. You know, sometimes the frustration within the household with the parent or the mother or the father, they take out that frustration on the child. So everything that that child does that doesn't warrant physical abuse now warrants physical abuse. And so this was an illustration of how that can lead into an abuse. And, again, I know we're going to have some who says, you know, spare the rod and spoil the child. However, there is a difference between correction of that child and abusing that child. And, you know, as we go on, we'll look at where that line is possibly and what can be classified as abuse and what can be classified as correction. So thank you so much again, once again, Sister Phil, feel free to stay on the line because we're just going to come around on the panel as this continue, this conversation continues to grow. Sister Mayana, are you there? Um, if you are, uh, go ahead. It's your turn. Yes, yes, I'm here. I was just uh, unmuted. I muted my phone. Uh, sure, absolutely. Thank you for uh, calling on me to speak to this matter. More than the usual urgency surrounding the many complexities and injuries that present themselves in our Hebrew community and family, there's a new surge of immediacy that calls for our attention to how we understand the female body and the female presence vis-a-vis how she is interpreted by others and what she should understand about herself. What we use to inform how we reach these conclusions will be key. We will 
Will we reach for the wisdom of the ancestors or will we be seduced by what's shiny and trendy and much easier to sell to both men and women? The women, you know, because when we look at the things that we are attracted to and the things that, that we are going to include or incorporate in our understanding, it's, it's very easy to do what is, is, is um, it seems like a, a, a solution to things when you are already in a very um, exhausted and wanting space. Do we express our, the question becomes, do we express our hostilities physically, emotionally, and verbally against each other because our counterpart is the only one who shares our disempowered state? I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to just say that, um, that this doesn't only affect the, the women. The second fly I created to promote this segment featured a series of faceless portraits of both men and women. The reason for this was to illustrate that we don't always know what abuse looks like. It was kind of an exercise in disconnecting our assumptions about who is abused and who can abuse. These and other questions will help us to begin to flesh out various violences that um, take place <clears throat> outside and inside the home, which is to say um, domestic spaces. As melanated people, we must examine, not ignore, the factors that are specific to our past and present, be they the way our parents gave us love or neglect, the ways in which we attempt to recover, reproduce, or create healthy relationships. When we have to take the task, the influences we have embraced, and what those ideas have imprinted on us to examine if and in what ways those ideas have corrupted our Hebraic goals or even healthy melanated objectives as a whole as it pertains to how we illustrate our love for each other and and, and the um, effort to strike a balance between uh, expressing ourselves assertively and dominating or, or oppressing the other person, no matter if that's the child, the sibling, the, the, the counterpart, the intimate partner, or, or what have you. Those are the types of things that we have to remain cognizant of at all times if we hope to achieve any type of mental, social, and, and you know, peace or, or help. All right. Thank you for that. That was the voice of Sister Mayana opening up on her thoughts on domestic violence. We're going to go to our brother Awar at this moment. And, Brother Awar, your thoughts? Uh, have you experienced this, seen it? Uh, do you know the signs to look for? Has it been within your sphere of influence, someone being domestically abused, whether it be man, woman, or child? Brother, oh, what am I yours? All right, all right. Well, first, you know me. First thing I, I want to do, I got to go into scriptures and show why domestic violence happened. Go to the genesis of them. I always go to the genesis. This is Deuteronomy twenty eight fifteen. It says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. I'm going to go to verse 54. So that that man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall lead. Verse 56, the tender and delicate woman among you, which will not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter. Then it says, I'm going to go to verse 28, it says, it says, the Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And this is where the, the psychological uh, damage come from as well, the madness in our minds. A lot of us are still right now, a lot of us in some form or fashion have a mental illness from some form of verbal or physical abuse right now in our heads that we even denial about or don't want to address. And then it says, and I'm going to go to verse 46, and then I'm going to pass it. This is verse 46. It says, And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. And as far as me seeing, 
I got to just say this right quick. As far as me, as far as, far as me seeing uh, uh, a domestic violent case, I knew of a certain sister that her mother was the aggressor in all her relationships with men. And what her mother used to do, her mother was so raw that she had two men lay, uh, living with her at one time. And every month when one of them got his check, uh, he received a bottle upside his head, and she took his check and spent it on her kids, and then she would vanish and come back every month. So there's women also that are just as violent as men. I mean, real vicious and evil. And there's some women that do voodoo on men, try to control their spirit. They're like, like the sister said, there's all types of forms of domestic violence that need to be addressed. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic. All right, now that was the voice of Brother Owo, and I'm I'm glad that he touched on the Deuteronomy portion as I was preparing for this. Um, that was definitely something that, you know, again, for those who are under, trying to understand the why and how a level of madness and disconnect from those who are related to you can occur, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, why? You know what I'm saying? Why can't, how could you do this? Because the truth of the matter is, and some people say, there's a justification. No, it's a reality. We, to a certain degree, coming out of, if you understand the history, this this level of a, a madness within the historical context that would drive the same person crazy. When you look at how we relate, that still has not been addressed. And uh, those issues, those intergenerational issues, the sister who spoke earlier spoke about coming to the point where within herself, this is where the Torah says, when you bethink yourself, that, wow, I don't want to do this. Okay, something is wrong here. This is not correct. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to continue this. I don't want to pass this on. But before we get into that space, you hear things like, well, this is how my, fa- my parents did it, and this is how my grandparents did it, and this is, this is my love for you. Um, you know, there's some spaces where calling people names is an expression of, quote, love. So all of these things that we have done and uh, that we have, in my estimation, that we have inherited, instead of, instead of inheriting riches, we've inherited uh, curses. And so all of these things that we have inherited, they need to be taken a look at. They need to be reinvestigated, revisited to see whether or not they serve a purpose. There are some spaces where people are whipping ch- children like the slave master did. And they think that, oh, see, it's just spread the spirit of rod and spoil the child, but they're not knowing that their last uh, illustration of what chastisement or correction was was not from a loving parent. Uh, historically, from the initial trauma, it was actually from someone who did not like you. It was from a slave master, you know, who would say strip you bare and then take a switch and then whip you until you bled or it'll take you with extension cords. Sometimes you see these memes and you want to see a level of psychosis that exists within us. We see these memes circulating and everybody, not a good amount of people have, uh, are able to relate to these memes. Like there's, I think there's one going around growing up black and many people can relate to them because it's a similar mindset that happened, whether or not you was in the Caribbean or if you were somewhere in the South. And so, again, this conversation and these conversations are needed, especially with us, in that we were, we were not all, but for those who were grown in a space where showing love was weakness, you know. And so you had to hide and cover um, a true expression of love, a tenderness of love. And, and if it was a tenderness expression of love as it relates to abuse, um, to sibling abuse as well as uh, adult elder to to sexual abuse is that this thing is perverted and so when you see somebody's niece or you see your your cousin or you see um you know your daughter and these and these people are not looking at them as this should be protected space as opposed to that they're actually looking at how can i exploit what kind of perverted thing can i do to this individual so i see a lot of stories coming across of sexual abuse Um, as children, mental abuse, emotional abuse as children, and that just lends to what we're talking about here, that all of these things have been passed on and oftentimes been told to be kept in secret. And uh, as a result, it has eroded the souls of many people who now, because they're looking for a change, say, oh, man, now I'm conscious. But they're consciously carrying or subconsciously carrying a whole lot of weight along with them. So 
Once again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to hear and see if the audience have their hands up, Brother Style, and then we're going to, you know, continue to pass the mic around. But we want to kind of give, uh, you know, a voice to those who may have been holding something or would like to share something or would like to give some direction at this time. So, Brother Style, uh, you could go ahead and look at the switchboard or if we have any comments on social media. The mic is yours. All right. Uh, actually, uh, Mafia is back on the panel, so we can uh, allow him to say his piece as well. Mafia, welcome to the show. How are you doing, brothers? Thank you, brothers and sisters. How are you? Um, yeah, well, I was able to hear the sister's story, and it was definitely touching. Um, and it most definitely hit home for me, not because I necessarily witnessed it, but I can understand um for you know, do, uh, from a certain perspective and level, that when it comes down to abusive violence, when it comes down to uh, domestic violence of any sort, caliber, regardless of who it's from and who it's towards, um, or most definitely hit it on the head when he went into Deuteronomy and he pretty much showed showed within that precept that it's pretty much outside of the Most High's will. You're pretty much outside of it when when you are you know, um, the perpetrator of, of any kind of domestic violence. Um, we can read all, we also see um, other verses in the New Testament that gives us the hint that allows us to see that domestic violence is pretty much comes from a selfish need to dominate. It's, it's, it comes from a source which is opposite of love. Um, I definitely don't think that's the case when it comes down to the sister story, you know, Obviously, she loves her son because she expressed eloquently her desire to protect him, even you know from the time that you know she uh, before he could walk or whatever. But on average, you know, in general, domestic violence comes from a place of of um, you know you not wanting to give yourself over to the other person for their well-being and for their benefit to put them in a salubrious situation so that they can benefit off of you, in a sense. Um, domestic violence comes from a spirit which is not of the most high because of the reasons that I aforementioned. So it is it is a serious issue. It is something that um, can lead to hurt, like it was like um, not just you, but for the people who are in the home who are also onlookers, who may not be the victims of, you know, of, of it, themselves per se as if to say that they are in direct uh line of it but you know when when children um witness domestic violence from one parent towards the other it can definitely leave a damaging psychological effect which they can carry over into adulthood and affect different aspects of their lives um that's that's pretty much pretty that's not something to play with in addition to that, it's also not something that anyone should be ashamed of. If they have been the victim of domestic violence, you know, it's something that you can bring to the forefront. You can confide in someone that you trust, someone who can pray for you, pray with you. In addition to that, give you the guidance and, and, and ask the most high to give you guidance that you may need to deal with the situation. And um, sometimes... Well, not sometimes, but the best situation, the best thing to do if you are able to do when you're in, when you're in that situation, if you can, because everyone's situation is different, the, the dynamics are, are, are different, would be to remove yourself from that situation, you know, because you do, you, you, you hear of Stockholm Syndrome where the, the, the victim of domestic violence can sometimes want to stay with their abuser for whatever reason. And sometimes they, the, the the victim will internalize the guilt and blame themselves for what they're going through. Yes, we do hear that it's predominantly, well, we're, we're, we're led to believe that it's predominantly women who go through these things. And that may be the case, but that doesn't also mean that men don't go through it too in some shape, fashion, or form, whether it be physical or even psychological and definitely emotional, you know, that will definitely play a part. So, you know, I think we're all unanimous so far to you know to say that this is not of the most high and we have to use his spirit and prayer and guidance to combat it and to most definitely let let anyone know who may be suffering from domestic violence 
that if you see fit, which I hope that you do, if you see fit to remove yourself from that situation and to take yourself out of it, that you're definitely not the guilty party. You have nothing to be ashamed of, that you need to get out of there for the simple fact that, you know, you, it is something that, that can lead to death. God forbid if it goes too far and and you die, then the people who are here who depend on you, your children, your loved ones, won't have you anymore. Okay? So there's no real reason for you to say that to be the doormat of this person who is abusing you. And that's both for men and women. You know, it's okay to remove yourself out of that situation. You're not out of the most high's will. You're not going, you know, you don't, you're not going to face eternal damnation because of that. It's wise, it's smart, and that's something that you should do. Um, and also, too, if, if, if any women are going through it, um, hopefully you do have men in your family um, who can pretty much intercede for you. Because I know that I have sisters. I've, I have sisters in my family who, when I've gotten wind that their boyfriend or significant other was trying to be physical, I, as the brother younger brother at that had never had a problem with showing this individual that there's a male around to protect her. You know, one in my um, experience, I told one of my boyfriends that I will make sure that his family buries him before I have to bury my sister. And that resolved the situation right there because he decided to leave her because he saw that there was a male force there was other masculine energy there to protect her, to protect this woman that she's not alone, that she has someone that that can that she can run to and who will go to bat for her. So you know, um, those of you who may not have um, close male relatives in your lives, that doesn't mean that you can't also find the same kind of help in somebody who you know who 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 can help you. You just have to leave yourself open to that option. And, and, and definitely leave yourself open to the guidance and grace of the Most High God who, who loves you and who does want the best for you and who most definitely does not want to see you in that situation. And with that, I'll pass the mic. Can I be heard? Yeah, you loud and clear. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I had dropped off. I want to thank our brother Matia for that for very thoughtful commentary and sharing so many um, poignant points as it relates to this conversation. One of the things that he brought up as I was listening is something that we touched on the relationship challenge last season, and a lot of people told us it was preposterous. And why would it be? You know, why do you need permission from your parents, or why do you need family approval? Okay, and so now on the other end of this very um, important conversation, he's letting credence to what we were saying, that when you are entering into spaces, um, and so oftentimes when people feel that you're unprotected, then you are more apt to be ex- uh, exploited depending on that individual. Because, again, maybe you were lured off, maybe you were cut off from family, maybe you were cut off from friends. So who's going to come and rescue you? Who's going to come to your aid? Who's going to aid you? Who's going to help you? And so it's very important to understand in these spaces where things of this nature can happen, we need, we need balance. We need right judgment. We need discernment. We need someone who can, we can appeal to and speak about situations. And it may take a, a father, a brother, an uncle, a grandfather to step to this individual and kind of like Laban did to Jacob. Don't mess with my daughters. See, you know, so when we're saying these things, sometimes people say, you know, it's restrictive. But when we see the, how much common sense it makes to uh, anticipate any issues that may come along the line, it, it becomes a very important factor. And so I want to thank Brother Matia for, for bringing that up and illustrating that point um, that, yes, we do need other voices um, in this conversation. So with that said, uh, Brother Sal, is there anyone on the line who would like to speak? Feel free to let us know. All right. So we're opening the phone lines, people, to the you know the audience out there listening on social media. If you're listening right now via phone or Skype, you're, if you want to chime in, just press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. Again, the topic is the, uh, discussing domestic violence in the community. 
You know, a lot of us actually uh, witnessed a lot of things within our own families when it comes to domestic violence or actually experienced it ourselves. So uh, feel free to speak about it right here on Debate Talk Radio. You know that number, 319-527-6239. We're going to, you know, go on the hear from the people out there that's listening. Uh, just got to press number one, and we'll add you in the conversation. Also, the chat room is open, people. The chat room is officially open. Uh, you can just go to the website, wildtalkradio.com forward slash debate talk for you and type in your question. I will read it out to the panel or to send me an email at debate talk for you at gmail.com. Uh, yeah, nobody's pressing number one at this time, so you can go with the dialogue. All right, then. So we're going to go ahead. I, I just wanted to say, and I'm going to come to Sister Adawa and say if, see if she had anything else to say. Uh, I think Brother Matia brought it up as it relates to control. And sometimes we don't understand how we get into these situations. This is where I speak a lot about self-improvement, um, self-awareness. Because if we, don't, if we are a witness to some of these things as we grew or grow, grow up, and we're not aware of how they have affected us, we internalize it. And after internalizing it, we kind of live a self-fulfilling prophecy of attracting those people that's going to reaffirm this subconscious thing that we have internalized. And so one pe- people will see that they go from abusive situation to abusive situation and think that it's always the other person. The reality is these are the signals that we're sending out because we have yet to deal with the fact that it still lays dormant within us. And so this is where soul improvement, self-improvement, self-awareness is very important within this conversation because some women and men will be like, oh, it was just you. You were just crazy, and I'm glad I got away from you. And then along comes a spider, you know, someone else, and you're like, yeah, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome and blah, 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 blah. Next thing you know, three, six months down the line, you're in the same situation again, and you're wondering. And this time, it may knock you deeper down into the hole. You know what I'm saying? This time, it may be a little bit more than it was last time. This time, it may present itself. And some of these things, there are warning signs there. But because uh, we're desensitized to a level of what is danger and what is not, we still proceed beyond these warning signs. We think controlling means he cares. You know, this domination means, oh, my baby loves me. Until that individual feels like they are losing control, and then they go to other means and measures of which to control. So I'll go into that a little bit more. But before I do, I'm going to go to Sister. I keep my sister name. Adi Yahoo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Sister, and, the uh, work is yours. Yeah, before, I keep the real. Yeah, my apologies. Go, yeah. And uh, just to let you know, Amuna, we do have somebody pressing number one. So uh, whenever you're ready. All right. So ready. after after the sister speaks, Brother Sal, we'll come back to you on the phone line. All right, sister. The mic is yours. Okay. Um, listening to all the dialogue, I was thinking about how um, when I was younger, my mom and my stepdad would always um, uh, fight. And um, like, um, whenever he would start drinking and stuff like that, uh, um, something will happen and, and it'll just be a fight that'll break out. You know? So um, then when I started getting a little bit older, like I said earlier, um, uh, some of that frustration and stuff was turned on me. And um, after I had my son and um, I bring him around my mother and um, clean him, and she looked at me crazy, right? Like I was um, doing something wrong, like I shouldn't touch him, like I um, um, should just let him do whatever it is that he wants to do, you know, and there'll be plenty of times that, I, like, I want to approach her and talk to her be like, why do you think it was okay for you to um, hit me like you did, but then you don't feel like I'm supposed to discipline my son, you know, and um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just really a, a different kind of view, I believe, that she has now like maybe she felt like I was worthy of it but um but he isn't or um it's 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 just something that I have to um I guess investigate more because like I said earlier uh this is something that I am that I am uh constantly um checking myself with because um like you said earlier Kimona um 
to um, uh, how some folks would say, not bear the rod and, and um, uh, stuff like that. Um, it's a balance that uh, we need to have. And uh, that's something that I, I, um, I had to realize um, that there is a balance, that there are some things um, um, that should be done and shouldn't be done. And I know that there are a lot, that there are a lot of Hebrew mothers that are dealing with the same thing. But I believe that uh, this right here is something that that um, that's taboo, right? That no one um, would really want to talk about having um, their own uh, frustrations, you know. And um, um, I sometimes misdirecting it, right? But um, when I look at me and my mother's relationship, when it comes down to my son, it's, it's, it's something that I'm yet trying to understand um, how that uh, whole situation worked. But yeah, um, that was, um, I'll pass the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much sis, for sharing. Definitely your words may be touching somebody right now, although they may be silent. Uh, like you said, there's, it's a taboo space, a taboo topic, but it is what is eroding among other things, the very fabric of our communities. And so it's something that, you know, we ain't scared. We're going to talk about So, Brother Sal, if you're there uh, and you said somebody's on the line, feel free to open up the lines and allow them to speak. All right, once again, people, the phone lines is open to the public out there that's listening to the show via Internet, live. Right here, checking out the Bay Torpy Radio. The number is 319-527-6239. We had a person press number one, but I guess they changed their minds. Again, I know this is a tough topic for some people, and some people feel like, you know, they don't want to, you know, share uh, certain things out there. But, listen, the more you open up and you talk to the people out there, the more, you know, people can learn. Somebody might be going through this, and, you know, you can help them out and help uh, help them find a way out of the situation. So don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Again, the number is 319-527-6239. And I see we got people on social media actually, uh, you know, talking about it, <laughs> and we appreciate the, the dialogue. But uh, feel free to vo- uh, let your voice be heard and call in. Uh, some people actually on social media are saying that um, uh, do do some women out there tend to blame themselves when it comes to uh, being a part of a domestic violence situation? Uh, some people see patterns of uh, women going to this. They might leave one particular man and go to another person, and they do the same things to them. Uh, so. Uh, do a lot of women tend to blame themselves when it comes to domestic violence? Um, uh, and Mona, you can uh, you know go ahead and uh, answer that if you want to. Yeah, I answer that, and I'll share it as as well to see if anybody would like to touch on that. Yeah, there's some you know, oftentimes women, not all, but some, have the the way of like like it's been said, take the blame onto themselves. So it's kind of like somebody who's been molested or abused or raped. They blame themselves if, if because that's a way of trying to internally kind of control the situation. If I had did this and if I had did that, you know, if I would have gone here, if I would have gone that, maybe it would have been different. That's the internal dialogue that a lot of us um, who are experiencing these troubling situations uh, actually begin to tell themselves. But like, like I was speaking about earlier, if the reason that you are attracting these broken individuals is not realized within yourself. So sometimes we're blaming ourselves for the external expression of whatever we do, but we don't go in to look at what is driving that. And so, again, yes, it does become this pattern because, again, it's that wishful thinking that maybe if I go over here, it will be better. The grass is greener over there. Maybe it was just this person and this person is different. You don't understand what I'm saying? And so just continuously going through this pattern, this pattern, this pattern without stopping is, is what lends to the reason that, in my estimation, the abuse continues. One time somebody said, Muni, are you trying to say that women are the poor? And, and, and that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that, yes, we do tend as women to take the responsibility and blame yourself um, for whatever is happening, as well as have this wishful thinking mentality that if I do something else or be more pretty or be more quiet or do whatever, then it's going to go away and not realizing that that individual has something within themselves that they need to work on. 
Uh, so it's just kind of a blurred line between responsibility and, and all of those things that come into play when we're talking about uh, how people view domestic violence and what's going on. Because sometimes they say it's justified. If you've been convinced that you're not that smart or you deserve it, and then you start to say, hey, it's justified. So along with whatever beatings or whatever the person is getting, we have to understand that sometimes verbal abuse works with it. So the person would have already convinced you that it's your fault, you know. And so that's definitely um, another part within the puzzle. But I'm going to check on Sister Mayana right now, and then I'm going to come to Brother Awar. Uh, you could definitely speak to that question if you desire or if you would like to add to the conversation. So thank you for that, Brother Sal. Sister Mayana, the mic is yours. Oh, I think it's a great question. Thank you for letting me um, weigh in on it. I, I would say that, yes, there are women that sometimes internalize what has happened to them and blame themselves for any range of reasons. Uh, I mean, on, on the one hand, it could be that it's easier to blame yourself than to blame the person that you are in love with or, you know, because you don't want to put them in, in, in a particular category where, you know, it, it contradicts all of the other feelings that you have for them. So maybe it's you, you know, that there's, there's that. And, and sometimes we we are taught, women specifically, are, are, or, you know, even in, our, in um, those of us who have come out of the churches, there's a an element of being told there's something honorable in suffering wrongfully. And so you also don't want to necessarily speak out. Then there's the there's also the variable of some women feel as if um, who are you going to tell? What is the point of crying? You know, wisdom cries out, but to whom? Who's going to hear? You know, there's nobody in the or, or mafia spent a good deal of time illustrating for us and discussing the ways in which um, having family members available, having that network available, uh, makes it easier for someone to to seek refuge from a bad situation. But if a woman doesn't have that or a person doesn't have that, then they're less likely to do that because there's no one who will respond. And if women uh, also have been socialized to feel like they have to protect the As mothers, as mothers and sisters and daughters, we want to protect uh, the masculine um, energy because we are always confronted with if we go to the authorities, they're not going to deal with them. They may kill them. You know, so it's it's like, okay, well, I don't want to do that either. So there are a lot of things that could possibly factor in on the mentality of a woman who is being abused and not crying out. You know, and then, it, and then Sister uh, Amuna is also touching on the very real possibility that in many cases, and some, not in many, I won't say many, but in some cases, women aren't, coming to terms with the parts that they play in in remaining in, in dangerous situations. Uh, to say a trap, I know that that would that's a trigger for, for many people hearing it. So instead, uh, we'll deal with the, the idea of remaining in dangerous, toxic, and, and, and injurious conditions, even if it's with someone you believe you have affection for. So those are my reflections. Uh, on that question. All right. Thank you for that, Sister Mayana. Indeed, 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 this conversation is one that needs to be had. I know it's not one that people probably want to jump up, put their hand in the air. Again, it's shrouded oftentimes in pain, in shame, in um, embarrassment. And so, you know, as we talk about Oftentimes people talk about nation building and what you know. This is the, this is the key to nation building, and that's the key to nation building. You know, uh, if we don't get beyond the hurt and the pain and the embarrassment and things we hide and the things that make us not achieve the fullness that we can individually, um, and from there within your family, then our thought of nation building is just an illusion, because people make up nation. You know, people make up family. And we knew we know that we're we, as a people right now we're suffering from many things, and this happens to be one of them. And we have to break the silence on this issue. You know, we cannot continue to see people who may be abused and say, "Oh, that's respect. Oh, that's honor." You understand? Like like the sister speaking about instilling a level of fear in an individual that they now compromise their own safety and their own integrity. That's not respect. 
That's something else. And so we have to, uh, as for those who are in these spaces, when they can observe these things, whether it be a man uh, speaking to another man, I was spoke about it some weeks ago when we were speaking about another topic and saying that in the space that he was at that time, and Brother Awar, correct me if I'm wrong, that men, when they saw certain things, they didn't speak to it. You understand what I'm saying? And so, you know, in the same way, women, when they see certain things, maybe they justify it. Maybe they say, oh, that ain't nothing. That's not that bad. At least he don't, bop, bop, bop. Do you understand what I'm saying? And these are the things, these are the unhealthy exchanges that even though we're seeing what's going on, we may lead others to believe it's normal. And we have to uh, reestablish a level of what is not just normal, because dysfunction can become normal, but what is actually healthy, and let that be the standard to which we try to attain to. So with that being said, I'm going to check on Brother Awar, and then, again, if you're out there and you would like to press 1, feel free to do so. Feel free to share your thoughts. If you don't want to share it verbally, put it on social media. Uh, tag Brother Style. He'll be able to read it. But Awar, are you there? The mic is yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say this, right? Um, the word love. Love can be very dangerous because it has two sides to it. It can work, it can be a benefit, or it can be a disservice. And I'll tell you what I mean. Like most women that are, some women that are in abusive relationships and they end up going back, and people wonder, well, that guy knocked your tooth loose. Why would you go back? Well, in my in my in my journey in my observation, a lot of times uh, these women lack love at the house, so they crave love from somewhere or some form of attention. So what they what they get from these guys is attention, but it's negative attention. So their premise of their mind is, well, as long as it's attention, it's all good. He give it to me because I've met women that. They love a man and knock their tools loose. They don't like the guy that love them and take them out and take care of them. They, they call that guy weak. Why? Because they were raised in a environment where nobody loved them the way they needed to be loved. So they, they think that's normal for somebody to abuse them. You have that. Same thing with men as well, okay? Young, young brothers. That's why a lot of these young brothers, they join these gangs because they're looking for love. Because they didn't have that father in there that said, look, you know, you're my son, you know. Uh, I, I love you, you know, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you I love you. You know, so I, I never suffered. I can speak for myself. I never had those issues or looked for love because I had great parents. And I had a father that always showed me love and gave me praise and it made me feel complete, you know. So I didn't have those issues, but a lot of my friends – they didn't have fathers that did that. They gave them that love. And not because they weren't there. Sometimes the father's there and still don't show that love because he wasn't show that love. It's a generational curse. That's why I went to the curses in the beginning, to show that those things would be passed through the genes, that hatred and that abuse, and it affect relationships. And we got to stop the cycle. How we stop the cycle? But later on, I'm going to pass the mic. Later on, we'll get into the solutions. I don't pass the mic. All right, now, Brother War is bringing it today because, again, you hit on some excellent points, Brother War. Um, it's intergenerational. It's epigenetic. Uh, it's within the genes uh, where we have learned. It's behavioral. These things that have been passed down, uh, people looking for things because within inside of themselves they're incomplete, whether it be male or female. And as you said, yes, some women – don't know how to receive love. You know, they don't know. It feels uncomfortable because it's, it, it, uh, because it's not, quote, normal. So whether or not she has been starved or whether or not she has been shown an inappropriate, uh, quote, expression of love, which not is love at all, uh, you know, it's a level of exploitation and abuse. But if this is her only reference point, then she's going to look for people, as I was saying before, to – Make her feel that way again. And so this is why they say, oh, well, you can't find a quote-unquote good man. It's because if, if you did see him, you would not know how to relate to him. And instead, 
you will want to relate to someone who, again, makes you feel that familiar feeling. So it all boils down back to, again, and I think our sister, I do, I, I keep saying, I keep, oh, most of I help me. Uh, you said it earlier that the individual, how do we break it? And Brother Awar asked about how do we break it as we are halfway through this conversation. How do we turn it around? Is that awareness? Is that bethinking yourself? Is that realizing, okay, listen, I know that something is wrong. You know, I, I know that I've been a recipient of this type of behavior, but I don't want to pass it on. So that the individual who's holding it now, the individual who was, you know, inherited this, it, it, is, it becomes them, it behooves them to bethink themselves and analyze themselves and see how they're interfacing with their mates. Is it getting the result that you're looking for with your children? Is it getting the result that you're looking for? Does it make you feel good at the end of the day? Are you drained when it's all over? Do you fight tug of war for attention and adoration? You know, because we could definitely, we can lie to ourselves, but only so far. But we know at the end of the day whether we feel good or we don't feel good. Um, you know, and so this is a good place to start when you begin to bethink yourself and, and really Look at how you're dealing with people in your sphere and uh, begin to find ways and seek out ways to change that behavior and turn it around. But, Brother Sal, is there anyone on the line at this time? Um, yes, we do. We have somebody on the line right now. Uh, again, we appreciate uh, the people letting their voice be heard. But before I go to that call, let's stand by. Let me go to uh, Adiyaho. Anything you want to say before we uh, go to the next person? Yes, hello. Are you there? Yes, yes. Yeah. This is Adaya Ho. Okay, um so so commenting from off of what Simona said, I don't know what you had said earlier, um um Sal? Sal? Yeah, yeah, I was okay. saying um some people blame themselves, like some women blame themselves because they tend to they might leave that man and then they go to another man, you know, and the same thing happens. Uh, you know, why do women blame themselves when it comes to uh, domestic violence, especially when they go from guy to guy and you know the same things are happening? Uh, how do you explain that? Okay. Um, well, I think that once we find out what the exact meaning of love is. Because uh, love in uh, this westernized world that we're living in now means so many different things. Like I can love cheesecake, I can love cookies, I can love my dog, but then I might, but where is the line to where we understand that, but it's not the same type of love? So when we're talking about a love off in Hebraic terms, then we can understand exactly what it is. And and so once we understand exactly what it is, then we can uh, be able to operate in love. But until then, we'll, we'll, we'll always have this distorted view of what we think love is because we don't have the knowledge of what love really is. And so then we'll continuously seek for what we saw it was on TV We'll continue to seek for what we thought was inside of our homes, which was probably really distorted anyway, you know. Um, but once we sit down and um, we read and we come up with the knowledge of what love is, what Yah intends for love to really be, and um, from my knowledge, um, that's sharing Torah, that's sharing the word, that's... Um, that's um, um, giving the word of God to our children, to our um, our families. Um, this is, I'm sorry. But yes, um, so yes, yeah, that's um, that's my take on it. Um, that's that's why I think so many of us um, tend to move from different relationships to the next, and it's it's like jumping from the pot to the skillet. And it's just work, you know. And then it's it's like a baton that we would uh, pass down to our children, and we would expect for them to carry it out the correct way. And our children don't know what love really is, so they're going to exhibit what we show them. So it's a vicious cycle until somebody is 
is able to really define and find out what it is and, and how to really love. And um and um so yeah, that's money. All right, we appreciate that, and we're gonna to go to the phone lines right about now. And I see we, I'm getting some good uh, comments from people out there and questions, uh, tagging me and uh, you know letting me know. <laughs> we're gonna read some of their comments. I, I got you. But let's go to the phone lines again. The number is three one nine five two seven six two three nine. When you call in, this press number one, and we'll add you to the conversation. Again, this show is archived. People, so you know, let's go back and go check it out later on. Let's go to the iTunes podcast, go to Blog Talk, go to YouTube, and check out the show. Just type in Debate Talk B Radio and uh, click on the show. And the chat room is officially open. I'm looking in the chat room. So whenever you guys have any uh, questions, is when you type it in, I'll read it out live to the people on the panel. But let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to eight zero three. Five five two, you're live on the air. Hello, Shalom. This is Nobia. Hello, Shalom. How you doing? How y'all doing tonight? All right. Good, good. All is well. So, um, I've been listening, and so, um, everybody's you know hit some really good points and everything. But at the end of the day, what I've seen is is that two things: toxic people, even if somebody, and a lot of people don't know that they're toxic. You know, they have that, that toxic energy. They don't know that it's there. So what they do is that they're, they navigate to that. That's what attracts them. Like always attracts like. So if you're a toxic person, not knowing that you are, you know, something may have happened to you growing up, you've been through some things, you absorb that toxicity into yourself. So you naturally will gravitate to another toxic person because, in a sense, not knowing you relate to the person. Um, and so that's generally a lot of times what ends up happening. Um, and so, and when I, I, I hear everybody saying, you know, going from relationship to relationship to relationship, and each one is the same thing. Well, the reason why nobody is learning anything is because they keep on popping into another relationship instead of stopping. Because, yeah, we all, you know, you have to, you know, to me, I am one for saying you need to be, you know, I can't live without a man. You know, it, 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 and uh, it's a natural thing. But at the same time, you have to learn to take time to be with yourself, to learn yourself. The thing is, is that nobody knows who they are. Everybody's been taught that you have to do this and do that, but you haven't sat there, sat by yourself and literally learned who you are as a person, as an individual. Learned your, your strengths, your weaknesses. You, you don't know. So you keep jumping into something, and now you're living for someone else. And I think a lot of people fall short of that because they have yet to learn who they are. You know, you've been through a lot of things, you know, hurts and pains. Now, how do you take those hurts and pains and make it your strength? They don't know because they haven't had a time, they haven't given themselves a chance because being alone, and a lot of, of this falls into fear. The fear of being alone, you fear, you know, that if you can't, if you don't have, if you're not in a relationship, your life is going to end. No, it's okay to be alone by yourself. It's okay to do that for a while because you need to learn who you are because you need to learn to love yourself. The thing is that you won't know about love until you learn yourself. Self is love. Self is everything else. Everything works together. So when you learn to love yourself, you start to see things. You start to see all the things that, like, whoa, that doesn't seem to, you start to see yourself elevated when you learn yourself. I mean, and that's for any doctrine that you that you read. It's going to tell you the same as that thing. Learn yourself. But everybody keeps thinking that you need to be with somebody, and they're supposed to teach you that. No, you don't need to be with somebody for them to teach you that. You learn that on your own. Because what they teach you is what, how they, their perception is of it. You need to have your own, not in a sense of perception, but there is something that will be a result to you when you start learning things, learning yourself on your own. Nobody else can teach you you but you. So I think with a lot of women, they've grown up in, you know, a lot of things going on. And, I mean, I and I can speak from experience. I've been through a lot of different things, you know, had things happen to me. I've been sometimes the person to do things. So I can honestly say it. I had to learn to love myself first in order to be in an assist relationship. Because before, 
I w- the things I say now, I wasn't saying it because I was toxic. I had to get rid of the toxins that I, that I was carrying. And the only way I was going to be able to do that is when I finally decided to be by myself, sit, and learn who I was. Learn what love was for loving myself first. You know, it does, you know, there's really no way around that. But people, again, it's all that fear factor throws in and everybody is scared. Oh my God, I'm going to die an old lady with 15,000 cats. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to be alone. Because the right person, once you learn yourself and you start realizing who you are, that person is going to come and you're going to start seeing things. And you're like, wow, okay, that's what I'm, you know. Things will be revealed to you once you learn certain things about you. And to me, all just evolves around learning who you are as a person, learning yourself. That's my take on some some of the same issues. I would thank the caller for that. Definitely, um, shared some very interesting points, some very poignant points. Echoed some of the sentiments uh, from those who've been on the panel and and speaking as it relates to you know all different sides of. Uh, this conversation, domestic violence, we've entered, I suppose, into the area of what is the causative factors, um, how do people get in these situations. It doesn't, you know, some people who may possibly be in it at this time, you know, there's different needs for people. So definitely if you have any questions or comments, feel free to share because, uh, you know, speaking outside and then speaking inside may be two different conversations. Um and so definitely we are keeping all of that in, in thought process in mind. So definitely we want to thank the caller for calling in. We're going to check on Brother Amatia, see how he's doing over there, if he has anything to add to the conversation. And then we're going to come back to Brother Sal to hit up the phone lines or social media to see what's going on. Brother Amatia, the mic is yours. Yeah, definitely been listening. And <laughs> find it in perspective uh, very interesting. Uh, one common thread amongst many that I've seen is that we've all pretty much agreed that when it comes down to domestic violence is that it's 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 definitely not of love. And I've heard several people make the point of trying to define love. And, you know, one sister even said that we have to stop looking at the, uh, she alluded to the idea of um, us not looking at the Western definition or idea of what love is. But um, when it comes down to the characteristics of love, um, it is it is uh, talked about in Scripture. Uh, I'll remind everybody of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where it pretty much says, it says, um, um, if I speak the language of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanking cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. But if I donate all my goods to be fed to the poor, and if I give my body to be burnt, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, is not boastful, is not conceited, does act does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, does not keep a record of wrong, finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for languages, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will all come to an end. So we see a pretty much healthy description as far as what love is. Love is giving. Love doesn't always seem to take. Love is love is the opposite of of selfishness. It produces the opposite fruits of selfishness. So if you're not in a situation where you're not receiving that, but not just receiving that, but where you are in a situation where you are in danger, clearly sees you clearly see that what you're receiving is not in line with what we see how love is defined in scripture. Then, like I said, it would be an added benefit to you to get out of that situation. 
and you definitely don't need to blame yourself for doing it. All right, so I'm not going to stay long. I'm going to pass the mic because I know everyone would like to say their piece. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity. Shalom. Thank you for that, Brother Amatia. Uh, um, thank you for that. Uh, Brother Sal, are you there? Uh, let us know any conversation that yeah. may be going on or anything that, you know, you already know. The mic is yours. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, definitely, we uh, just opened up the phone lines for the audience out there. Uh, I'm hearing some feedback. Uh, so if you're not talking, this question, I'm mute on your mics. And, um, so yeah, I'm hearing some feedback. There you go. There you go. All right, once again, the number is 319-527-6239. The phone lines is open for the masses out there. Let's go to the phone line. Let's go to 1614. I believe it's my brother from Australia. What's going on, brother? How you doing? Welcome yeah, to the show. yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, shalom. All the way from Australia, man. How you good? Chilling, man? Appreciate you. All right. Good, good, good. How, how how's things over there? Uh, things are yeah. pretty good, man. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, what's your, uh, you know, what's your, um, what do you have to say about the topic, domestic violence? Well, well, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a problem within. Obviously, I know the brothers is the the so called African American people and. In the United States is a big problem. I'm pretty sure it's the same with the Hispanics, the uh, the Native Americans. Obviously, I'm an indigenous person to this part of the world. It's a big problem within our communities. But uh, as a, uh, getting to the definition of love, according to the Bible, First John five and three says, "For well, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments." So, so if we are keeping God's commandments, and, and that is our Moral stick for for love, uh, you know these domestic violent problems wouldn't be happening, you know. So you know, it's, it's definitely an issue that's that's hidden even amongst our communities. You know what I mean? We, it, uh, I agree with the sisters there. Like we don't we don't really openly talk about it, you know. And it, it, if you keep hiding these things, you know, they they, they will never be addressed. Like the scripture says, if you get hide of it, sin will not get mercy. I'm just paraphrasing, but, uh, you, know, it, you know, just calling up, you know, just to uh, give a shout. You know, we're listening to you down here in Australia, and, uh, you know, all the brothers and sisters on the panel, you know, you know good job, and may the most high bless you all. All right, well, we appreciate you calling in, and we appreciate that. Uh, again, we're looking to hear from the people out there. The phone lines is open. I know, again, you know, this is a rough topic for some people out there, but, you know, uh, the beginning steps is to actually speak upon these topics. We need to do these uh, dialogues and discussions in order to heal. Again, the number is 319-527-6239. And uh, let me read some of the things that's going on on social media. Uh, some people are actually saying they do not believe that this is happening within the Hebrew Israelite community. They understand that it's happening to people that are in the world. They don't know the Bible. They don't know Torah. You understand that? But some people actually are saying they don't know anybody that's going through this once they become a Hebrew Israelite. Is that true? Let's go to a water swordsman. <laughs> if you, well, I know when I came up, I've been in this while. And it was a brother. One time I was uh, I was downtown in, in New York. And I, I ran to a younger brother, and he said, "Yeah, man, I was just coming from court." I said, "Yeah, I said, yeah, I think you went to court for." It. He said, "Well, I knocked my baby's mother's teeth out." I said, "What?" He said, "Yeah." I said, uh, "Why would you do that, brother?" Well, there was a certain brother in the school that was a high-ranking guy. I ain't gonna say his name. He said, "I went to his class." And he told me, he said, your woman get out of pocket, knock her teeth out. And he said, and I did it. <laughs> and he said, i tell you like this. He said, that woman scared of me to this day. So it do happen. Some women are just not telling. I don't know about now. I don't know if brothers were fine, but when I was coming up, brothers was knocking women teeth loose. All right, Amuna. <laughs> wow, bro, brother will all be having those antidotal stories for real. Uh, I, I like, like you said, I could, um, you know, been walking in this space for a while. I could attest to, as I said, it's it's happening, but because 
we are either I in denial or B do not know what signs to look for. And big up to the brother who called in from Australia down under. Um, because we don't know what signs to look for or choose not to see them, then we misconstrue our reality, what we're seeing, and pass it off as, oh, this person is being respectful, oh, this person has their household in order. And because there oftentimes is no justice, no um, no system or no space, no bait dean, no judges for you to go to, for this to be known abroad, it's held in secret and it's covered in silence. And, of course, if you're in a space where it's, you don't care, it's not going to be there, it's not going to appear. But I guarantee if you pull back the covers, not only are you going to see it, you're going to hear it, and you're going to understand, like, wow, I didn't know that this was here. So, you know, hopefully this conversation will bring an awareness to the reality that it is here, and, you know, we have to pay more attention to it if we're going to talk about nation building. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic to the other panelists to share their thoughts. Mariana? Um, to to um to finish what the sister stated, um, I too have been in the trenches for some decades now and I can attest that there are definitely issues of domestic abuse happening in the community. Unfortunately, that's something that I have seen. I've had um women come to me and recount gruesome um, instances of physical violence. Uh, there's also all of the accounts of emotional violence, and um, this is. And I'm saying this because obviously women are going to communicate with me more than the men will. That's not to so. I'm not saying that it's not present for the men. I'm just saying that you know my my location is the way I am located in the community. Obviously, I would have more interactions with women, but I do know that our men are also facing a great deal of being um, doubted in terms of their ability to lead. And so they often hear a lot of really harsh and demeaning criticism, you know, which also affects the way that they are able to effectively participate in their roles and they feel beaten down in, in a very real way, even if it isn't in a very physical way. So it, it it would be hard for me to imagine that our community wouldn't be experiencing this type of abuse when our community doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, the reason that the Hebrew community is is very likely and obviously really realistically um, affected by this is because we are not disconnected in, in every way. We haven't severed all of our ties with the overall melanated community. The overall melanated community is facing a great deal of negative. Um, we have a lot of maladaptive behaviors in the way that we treat one another, where we understand one another, the way we communicate, and we don't communicate with one another. So that's why in, in the, my introductory statement, I was saying that we really should uh, it would benefit us to kind of look at what is informing those those moves, what is informing those actions, why are we being physical in this way? Is it because we only understand our partner as the other disempowered person, so we abuse who we can abuse? And so if if this is the case in the melanated, the overall melanated community, as I want to point to earlier, the fact that we are a Hebraic people doesn't take away from the fact that we are a broken people. We're just a broken people that know we're broken. That's that's the only real difference, and we are we have access to solutions, but do we know how to implement those solutions? It doesn't make any sense to have the best medical technology available to you if you don't know what to do with it. And that's what Torah is. It's the best medical technology possible available, but a lot of us, we're so far away from our training, so disconnected from from our, our, our wisdom that we don't know what to do with it. So we have not yet implemented it yet. We have not yet... Uh, put into practice all of these different notions of, of love. This is a brought up love and the idea that this is important. Uh, two brothers came and gave us definitions of love. Here's the thing. Hebrew has four words for love because there are different ways in which it, it gets expressed in different spaces. Just like the Greeks have different ways of loving. Yes, when we talk about the, the, the language that we're uh, accustomed to or familiar with, like she just said, we can say we love pizza. You know, we love that car. You know, we we use the word love in all these many 
wonderful ways. And then when it comes to expressing it, when it counts and in ways that are of comfort and of healing, we fall short. So, you know, you know, yes, to answer the caller's question in short, absolutely. Whether or not uh, we want to believe that we are still in the muck and the mire, that, so, that we are, we are, we're still there. We are still there because although we are Hebrew people, we are broken people and we are not put together yet. And denying it and wanting to believe that we are in a better space is not going to um, solutions that we need that we are in desperate need of. We have to acknowledge that we are in pain before we can, and so that we can seek the help that we need. All right, we're going to go to the rest of the panel, but I see somebody press number one. Let's go to 917-586. You're live on air. Hello? 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 Five hundred eight point nine eight. All right. <laughs> five or six. Five or six. Okay. But I didn't press number one. Now, 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 somebody else uh, had the same kind of number in the, in the beginning part, part okay. of it. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess they, I guess they're not saying anything at this time. All right. Well, if we go to you, uh, Amati, I guess you wanna. Um, is this really going on within our community? You know, let's let, let us know. Yeah, Amati, I guess you can comment. Go ahead. Well, yeah, it's most definitely going on in our community. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I've seen examples of um, of domestic violence in 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 our own community, and um, you know, th- thankfully I've never been a, a a part of it, but I have seen it from a distance amongst people who call themselves Hebrewites. So that's definitely not um, uncommon to hear. And a lot of the times, because it goes on in the in the community, you would think that the community would be to help the people who are victims of domestic violence, especially if they're women. But a lot of times, the women will find it hard to find help in the community because they think that their brothers will come together to protect the men. So basically, the the community will come together not to protect them, the abused, but to but to protect the abuser. And that's the kind of favoritism that we most definitely need to rid ourselves of and to understand that right is right and wrong is wrong. And if there are women who are being abused or men who are being abused, then we have to um, take their side and defend the righteousness at all costs. So most definitely it's happening. And, um, you know, we need to do something about it. And with that, I'll pass the mic. All right, uh, well, Mona, you can uh, take it away. No matter else, press number one at the yeah. time. You can take it away. I'm sorry. I was over here on mute. Uh, yeah, definitely. Again, it's it's a conversation where you just have to plant a little bit of seed, spread a little bit of water, you know, have the conversation, air it out, and then, you know, you'll probably get emails or inboxes or text messages to uh, let you know that, listen, I was listening and I heard you. It's one of those topics that, you know, it's like that the other ones that we have. It's something that we have to deal with within ourselves. And so just because this is the space, if anybody doesn't, anybody doesn't know, my name is Amuni Israel. Like, this is my space. Speaking about tough situations and things that are existing, being real about it, and finding pathways to healing. And until we take responsibility for the things that we are responsible for, we can't expect the creator is going to deliver us into a space so that we can be even more maladaptive and more dysfunctional. And so while many of us choose to argue over things that may be beyond us, this particular thing is not. And once we get into, as Awar said and as Brother um, Amatia said and as the caller from Australia said, when we get into alignment with the creator, Because we are out of alignment and the frustration has come upon us and the burden of our captivity and dispersion have come upon us and we are at the bottom and oppressed, many times, especially masculine energy as well as feminine energy, when that weight comes upon you, you're going to look for a place of which to express that frustration and it comes out as abusive behavior. 
Well, because energy cannot, energy has to go somewhere. So either you're going to implode and make it uh, tear down your internal system, or you're going to explode and then you're going to serve it up to those who are around you. And so it's not that these, and, and I like what the brother said, because if you look at certain spaces in the world culture, this level of abuse exists. Sometimes we like to think that it's exasperated within our community, but this level of abuse exists in other spaces. Um, and so that's something that's very important to know that we are not the only peoples. There's, you know, European people suffering. There's different people suffering with abuse because it's a human condition. Um, exploitation of one another, oppression of one another, it's a human condition. But based on the conditions that you're in, it can be exasperated. And that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Christians are not exempt. Muslims are not exempt. Hebrews are not exempt. And so once we get past that point of, I can't believe it, that disbelief, we can actually enter into spaces where we can deal with the issues, um, hold the people accountable, and set pathways to healing. And so, um, you know, Brother Sal, if we don't have any questions or comments, we probably go around and hear the last thoughts of everybody and just kind of let it, you know, sometimes you have to make the pot simmer. So I'll give it back to you, Brother Sal, and, and see if we can just go around the board one more time and then we can let it rest. All right, Sim Sim up. <laughs> nah, man. Sim Sim up. You know, that was 319 <laughs> 527 Beanie Man song in it real quick, but Sim Sim chill out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I see, uh, actually, I see one more good question over here. Um, yeah, let me see. Uh, let me check it out. And now, again, feel free to call in. You know that number, 319. 319- Five two seven six two three nine. This person number one, I will add you when we have like seventeen minutes on the air. Uh, let me uh, get this question. It says, um, uh, having gone through a, a domestic violence relationship, being in an abusive relationship, how do I ensure that my children are not affected after seeing abuse and beatings of the yeah, things that I need to abuse of beatings? Yeah, that's what it says. Okay, I, uh, I'm on. I'm on Uh, well, I can almost tell you that they're affected, so that's the place okay. to start. If they, if they saw it, if they experienced it, if they were witness to it, they're affected. You, um, in my estimation, you have to give them an opportunity to express uh, where they are, depending on their ages, whether it be drawing it out, speaking it out, writing it out. You have to give them avenues of which to express honestly without uh, censoring their feelings to it, because if they're really young, you might have the opportunity to um, show them another, uh, another, uh, an, an alternative that's going to help to uh, not cement that trauma. But if you leave the trauma alone and if you hide it or you make them to feel embarrassed or whatever or ashamed of expressing this, what they're going to do, they're going to do is go within their own child mind if they're children and begin to rationalize. And however that personality, because everybody has different personalities, and this is just my experience, depending on the personality of the child, they're going to rationalize it differently. So one child may become, you know, this extrovert that's looking for the attention. The other child may become, you know, unnaturally quiet. The other child may, you know, develop whatever they develop depending on that personality. So I would definitely, as a mother or as a father who knows that they saw it, don't pretend that you don't know they saw it and have spaces that you may, you know, every week or whatever the case may be, secure time that you're able to have them sit down and just share. And it may be the first time around they say nothing to you, but they have to then now begin to feel comfortable enough to share with you how they felt about what they saw. And, again, uh, you know, for me that's a good starting point. So I would say that, and then I'll pass it on. Yeah, a person asked me made a follow up uh, comment uh, to that. They said, um, uh, "My children tend to make excuses for their father. Uh, their father would drink, and they would actually use that as an excuse when they explain it. When people talk to them about the issue, uh, you know, their father would basically, you know, drink, and it would be their reason for excuse." Um, all right, now let's go to Mayana. Anything you want to say? In, in response to the caller, I would agree that. Children are affected by abuse because children are affected by everything we expose them to. Uh, just as we understand that the positive images and experience, experiences that we make for our children create an imprint for the child, 
negative ones do as well, you know. So I would say uh, in terms of what do we do from there, I would, I would recommend having an honest conversation with the child. Um, as I remember said, children are expressive at different uh, levels depending upon their age and, and, and where they have um, developed in, the, in that area of communication. But even if they're not necessarily at the age where they can um, – articulate complicated or, or difficult ideas as adults we can we can tell them we can we can be honest with them and we can explain you know what you saw is not uh, representative of what good adults do or um, what you saw mommy do mommy was angry and should not have done that what you saw daddy do was angry you know he was he was upset and he was upset about something else but the way he handled it was not a good idea this is how we handle things when we are upset and, and, and have those kind of conversations with them. And it sounds like it might be a really kind of uh, high-level communication, but it is children are looking for you to make sense of the world for them when they don't have access to information. When children are very small, you are their Internet. You are their information highway. You are the person that they are going to trust um, to be this wealth of information, of good information for them. And if you're afraid, then you transmit that fear to the child. If mommy can't talk about it, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about it. If daddy can't talk about it, maybe it's not something that I say. Or I'm not supposed to expect Am I supposed to pretend it didn't happen? And this is the beginning of of, of maladaptive um, behavior and responses in, in situations that, will, that can potentially spill over into other parts of their lives. And, and, and when they're directed, children express that kind of repression in different ways. It, it can manifest in not communicating at all, over-expression. When you make too big of something, something very small to hide how it makes you feel, they make really big gestures and it's exaggerating gestures because they don't have that balance and they don't know what's going on. And the people that they trusted um, weren't there. So they did in these periods of times where we're building trust versus mistrust, these periods of times where children are um, having their attachment phases, these are very important um, points where the involvement and the engagement of the adults that, that are in their lives are critical. Uh, let's go to um, Adiyaho. Adiyaho. Okay. Okay. Um... Well, my suggestion would be is that as a mother or as a father, um, for you to put yourself in the shoes of your child, your children, just imagine yourself as that child. Uh, Just take some time out to really, um, um, and I mean some good time, like maybe not just one day, not just two days, not just three days. Just to vote a week or maybe two weeks or or an ongoing thing that you will do, clearing your mind and uh, trying to figure out um, imagining yourself as your child and what they saw and how you would have liked to have been approached at that particular age. Um, and then start to be it's, it, it's going to have to be some type of detoxification that's going to have to be done in order to make sure that this uh, this trauma um, does not continue in this child's life. You know, um, so when I say detox, um, it's going to be some things that you may have to take away, that you are going to have to limit, that you are going to have to uh, censor when it comes down to what your child sees, what your child hears, um, um, even down to what they eat, you know, so that you can be able to to um, gain control of the issue. Because right now, right now there is no control. It's all over the place right now. And the child is really vulnerable, as you are. And uh, there's this saying that um, 
the children are the future, right? But for the adults and the children lives life, um, if they don't have it together, if their mind is not um if their mindset is not where it needs to be when it comes down to parenting their children, then that child is not going to be the future. The future of their child is not going to be good. Instead, it's going to produce some of the um, um, some of these children, some of these grown men and grown women out here that have self-hate. They hate their mothers or they hate their fathers because the issue um, that is placed on them at a very early age was then addressed in a way that can help them in their future. So when it comes down to detoxing, which you, the mother or father, to kind of just get it together in order to know how to properly properly um, speak to your child um, and to protect your child from here on uh, then so that uh, they won't continue to be uh, witnesses to uh, to anything traumatic like that again. Not after my uh, All right, Awards Wasman? Yeah, um, that's why it's imperative women know their manual because you, you have to know the difference between right and wrong. That's what the statues in the gospel bring us, okay? The right and wrong in the gospel give you the information on how spirits act, you know, the inside of people's minds and how spirits take them over to cause them to do things. And I'm going to give you this example. I was with a woman one time. And me and her was talking, I said something she didn't like, and she smacked the tot off my teeth, right? So I wanted to react at that moment, but I said, let me use wisdom, because she wasn't in her right mind, and I know if I would have said something at that time, she would have uh, it would have bounced off her. So I waited till we was having a nice time. We were, you know, having a nice little party, and I told her, I said, I'm going to tell you like this. I said, if you ever do that again, it's over. And she never did it again. So what I'm saying is when these women get drunk, these guys get drunk, and they use that as an excuse, wait till he's sober, you're having a nice time, pull them, get get the Bible, and bring out these scriptures here that's in Ecclesiastes 31. And it says, and it tell you, it gives you the whole understanding and rundown on why. And you said, look, you got a problem. And I said, if you do that again, I'm going to leave until you get your problem right. And when he see you mean business, that's how you straighten things up. This Bible straighten out everything. And I'm just going to say that and pass that. Uh, Mafia. Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, everyone pretty much summed it up uh, quite beautifully. I just want to encourage those who are, who may be going through it, again, not to be ashamed, and please, if you can't look for outside help, um, there's nothing to be ashamed of because you're not the only one going through it because we want to see you in a better position, in a better place, and so does the most high. And with that, I'll pass the mic. All right. So, you know, hopefully the people out there get, gather some good information. I know you did. You know, hopefully you want to throw some things down. And you can go back and listen to the show. It's archived, people. Let's go to the iTunes podcast, Wild Talk Radio, YouTube, check out the archives, and hopefully, you know, this will help you in some way, shape, or form in the, in the, in the present and in the near future. But let's go to Amuna, and we're going to get some last words from everybody. Go ahead. All right. Um, uh, like Brother Amati said, I, I like that he keeps driving that point home. That you're in, If you're in this situation, definitely seek help. Do not suffer in silence. Uh, you know, putting yourself, your children, um in harm's way if it's you or if your children is not, you know, suffering for righteousness. You really need to appeal to whether it be your family, um, the individual's family, or some space in which you can get to safety. Uh, Self-preservation is very, you know, it's very high on the list of how it is that we're going to serve the true and living power. You kind of have to be alive to be able to do that. 
And so, um, again, you know, look out for the children. Uh, minimalize whatever damage that you can. And if you if you don't know what signs and symptoms to look for, I, I bid you to do some research. As the caller said, and as we've been saying, do some reflection within yourself. If you're if you're coming out of an abusive relationship, definitely don't think that you're in love with the next person that jumps in your inbox. Just go ahead and put a pause on all of that and begin to reflect within yourself so that you can root out the cause of the issues that keeps getting you into these situations. So um, with that said, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I'll give everybody else uh, an opportunity to say their last words, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up, Brother Sal. Uh, let's go to Adiyahu, and uh, once again, I want to give a special thanks to you for actually uh, coming on, you know, a person that actually went through a lot of these things. So I definitely appreciate you for coming on the show. Any last words you want to share with the audience? Um, sure. Um, just a couple. I can remember that we need to take responsibility and accountability for our actions. And uh, the first way of doing this is to be able to accept that we are going to something that we have been because there's feelings to be made and we can only do these things if we can grab a hold of that accountability and then and only then um, is that we can be able to seek, we can be able to heal ourselves and then others so that uh, we won't continue to be hurt um, or hurt or anybody else that's it, I'll back the mic Shalom Alright, Shalom. Hopefully we get you back on the platform very soon. We appreciate your information. Uh let's go to a water swordsman. Last words. Yes, sir. I'm gonna leave on this. This is Ephesians four twenty two. That she, cause we we have the right to reset ourselves. We all made mistakes, we all made wrong decisions. So brothers, if you're abusing these women, reset yourself. Sisters, if you getting abused or you're abusing, you're very abusive with your mouth, reset yourself. And this is how you reset yourself. This is Ephesians 4.22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Then it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after the Most High is created in righteousness and true holiness. So reset yourself and put away that evil thought and the evil ways that you've learned and have adopted or inherited from your gene pool. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic. All right. That's the water swordsman. We appreciate it, brother. Uh, let's go to Mayana. Last words. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I wanted to – I'm going to have to briefly do everything because I, so much has been said since the last time I was able to speak on, on what the – Channel was saying so. The sister briefly was talking about the the abuse the, the abuse that her, was perceived by her mother when she was disciplining her child. And I wanted to just kind of to suggest that it doesn't always look like the abuse. It doesn't always look like abuse when the abuser does it. But an emotional distance allows um, an abuser sometimes to recognize what's unacceptable when they see it in others. So maybe some of that is at play with that question. Uh, when the brother war opened up, the uh, last time I got a chance to talk about it, he did go into Deuteronomy and he did read the portion where the women uh, who might be tender among us and such and such have a particular response to um, uh, or affect because of disobedience. But in the 54th verse, there's also that the, the, the tender uh, man among us will do all of these things and, and turn against his wife and abandon his children. And so um, the reason of bringing that is to go back to the idea of striking a balance, to not um, to put to stack the blame on one side of the scale and, and be dishonest about how things are playing out because that type of dishonesty does not allow for healing. We have to recognize the parts that most of us are complicit in, that, yes, the women have responded to disobedience and have the, the effects of disobedience in one way, but this is affected our men, too. We need to understand why uh, that behavior is happening on their side, too. That, too, is predicted and prophesied in Deuteronomy, and that has to be uh, stated. The brother of uh, Mati, when he brought 
out that a lot of the times the women are crying out, but what they find is that the the uh, support isn't on their side. That's one of the things that I was trying to bring out earlier, too, when we say that there's the idea of if I do cry out, who's going to listen? Who's going to believe me? Who will come to my rescue? And um, too often, as the brother said, the rescue goes to the men, and not that the men aren't always in a position where they need help, but sometimes uh, that help is only available to them, even when they're not the victim. The other part about we were talking about the sister had concerns and Amuna just the concern that maybe the uh, spare the rod, spare the child mentality or concept might come up. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to drop is that the rod uh, was a, is not always an instrument of abuse or violence. Instead, the shepherds use a rod to for the purpose of guidance. So the idea of sparing the rod, if, if, if a lamb was going outside of the herd or was going too far off of the road, that, that rod was used to guide. If you heard that a shepherd had used his rod on his herd, no one would imagine that he beat you know, the lamb is so bloody pope, but instead would have a proper understanding of, of this guiding um, um, motion instead of this abuse. So I would caution people to be too critical of our sister when she talks about um, wanting to ease up on discipline and, and not going immediately to this idea of sparing the rod means to be harsh um, or physical with the child. Uh, just to sum up now, there's the, the ideas of Deuteronomy, um, to, and, and, and not having to stack it in this way, what it does is it shows us that these are the consequences of our disobedience. But in what we, how we've been disobedient, we discuss here that the disobedience has come from not following the commandments and not doing what we needed to do and following um, strange ideologies that are getting enticed by thoughts of diminished Torah as the leading authority or turning away from the wisdom of our creator. So when we look again at the language that we use to describe even our most intimate acts, it comes from this idea and this departure from the way we are supposed to perceive each other, what roles we are supposed to take, how all of this is laid out for us according to Torah, and where have our ancestors spoken this way about the population between man and woman? I'll hit it, I'll smash it, you know, I'll dig it out. All these, this is very vulgar language is something that is possible to our disconnect from our affection for one another. And why are men comfortable saying this? Why are women comfortable hearing it? And so, you know, this this all kind of stems from these other things that we're influenced by. The, the, the rude words that we are used to think about our women. A lot of it comes from Aristotle. It doesn't come from Abraham. And that, you know, I can't really get into it now because time doesn't permit. But, um, you know, those are my thoughts. And so with that, <laughs> I will yield the floor. All right. And uh, that's my honor right there. We appreciate her uh, as usual. And let's go get the final words from Amapia. Last words, brother. Um, well, um, I don't know what else to say, you know, because, um, all the points have, well, not all, but most of the good points have pretty much been brought up to the forefront. And, um, I would just also like to stress as a matter of fact, um, what I did say earlier about all the help went, did go to the abuser and not the abuse. And that is something that if, if, if we do plan on nation building on any level, it's something that we do have to have to watch out for and keep an eye out for because it would be a tragic thing where if a woman or a man, you know, were to face dire consequences when prior to that the person was crying out and the same people that they're looking to build a nation with turned a deaf ear to their cry. And that's something that I definitely wouldn't want to happen. That's not something that I would ever want on my conscience or the conscience of anybody else. So, you know, with that, again, so if you are in that situation, please seek help because, because there's no honor in allowing your face to be a punching bag. Nobody ever got paid off of that unless you're a professional boxer, which I don't think any of us are. So please, um, and with that, I'll just leave it that way. Thank you. I'll pass the mic. <laughs>
When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can seem intense. Like breakup R and B intense. I thought you said you love the sweater that I got you. If you didn't, you could have told me. Geico makes it easy. Just go to Geico.com anytime to update or check your policy without all the extra drama. I even had a gift receipt. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to geico.com and you can save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. <laughs> 